I think they wish they'd sang more and preached a little more and testified. And it's strange how this book can change people so much. It's, it's strange how you see people's countenance just like that. I've preached a lot of times now. I'm just a young man, but I've preached a lot. God has opened up a lot of doors, and I've stayed busy for 11 years. I've stayed busy, busy, preached 250, 300 times probably every year. Just busy, busy, busy preaching. And so it's, it's a subject that I, I've seen a lot of things. I mean, preaching a sermon and you've got people just with you. And then you pull it on down a little bit. Same spirit, same love, same compassion, same book. And they just sit down. And what was a smile goes pale. I've seen it happen so fast. And then you fight the whole sermon, the rest of the sermon. Lord, did I just kill them? And I did it just, this book, it, it, it is sharper than a two-edged sword. And, and that's not really the thing. It pierces to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. Can you imagine how sharp that is? That it can divide the soul and spirit. We can't even hardly d- uh, understand, fathom the difference between the soul and the spirit. It would take me a, an hour sermon to explain to most of you the difference between the soul and the spirit. And the Word of God can separate it just like that. That's sharp. Piercing to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and the joints and marrow. And then it says it is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. That's why. That's, and a lot of times those pale-faced ones, they meet you after church and they say, how did you know that? I, say, well, I didn't know it was you until just then. You just told me. <laughs> and then... Uh, countless times I've had them walking away saying, I know brother so-and-so told brother Lamb that. There's, you know, And get mad. I mean, Sister Lamb be my witness. I've had some just get mad at me. And I'm not never coming back because the pastor told me and I blasted. And you know, it's just this book. It's just this book. It works if we'll let it. If we'll let it. We're always saying, God speak to me. God speak to me. God speak to me. What do you, what do you think this is? It's, it's got an answer for every issue, every one. And I believe it's got an answer for some of us tonight. I, I don't really feel like preaching, to be honest with you. I don't feel, I've been really heavily oppressed today by the enemy, but I, I've come too far now. Uh, he has to do a little better than what he's done today. And it's not oppression over me, it's oppression over the church. I feel a heavy load. I guess that's... Not that, well, I guess oppression is the correct man, or correct terminology. I've had a heavy load for the church today. And uh, I'm going to deliver this message that I've got from the Lord. Probably not going to be much of a sermon. As a matter of fact, I didn't even finish it up. I've just got just what i got here. So I'm going to preach the best that I can. And it's not real important that you think that I preach good tonight. It's just real important that you get what I've got to tell you. So let us open our Bibles to Second Samuel chapter 23. Second Samuel chapter 23. She usually gets on to me for taking my jacket off. Because I'm all wrinkled up. But I promise you, Sister Lamb always irons my clothes. Second Samuel chapter 23, verse 20. If you have that, say amen. The Bible said in Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, the son of a valiant man of Kabziel, who had done many acts, he slew two lion like men of Moab. He went down also and slew a lion in the midst of a pit in time of snow. And he slew an Egyptian, a goodly man. And the Egyptian had a spear in his hand, but he went down to him with a staff and plucked the spear out of the Egyptian's hand and slew him with his own spear. These things did Benaiah the son of Jehoiada and had the name among three mighty men. He was more honorable than the thirty, but he attained not to the first three. And David set him over his guard. He went down also and slew a lion in the midst of a pit in time of snow. That's a very huge Phrase. He went down also and slew a lion in the midst of a pit 
in time of snow. Let's pray. Father, You know my burden tonight. You know the heaviness of my heart, but it's only there because the Holy Ghost has put it there. I'm not discouraged tonight. I'm not beat down tonight. I feel Your power. I feel Your grace and Your glory. I'm asking You to pierce our hearts tonight. Divide our souls and spirits. Discern our thoughts and intents. Guide us, Lord. Put something within us, Lord, that we take home, that challenges us, that breaks us. And Father, we'll be very careful to give You the glory. We pray this in Jesus' name. Somebody shout Amen. Amen. You may be seated. And Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, the son of a valiant man of Kabziel, who had done many acts, many acts, he slew two lions like men of Moab, and went down also and slew a lion in the midst of a pit in time of snow. Now, this man Benaiah was the son of Jehoiada, as we've read here. He was the commander of David's bodyguards. He's a bad dude. It really was. I wouldn't want to fault him. You wouldn't either. Now, several instances of his rare bravery are recorded. 2 Samuel 8, 18. 2 Samuel 23, 20 through 23. We just read. We'll read it again. And he adhered to Solomon, and some favored the pretensions of Adonijah, but he didn't. He stayed with Solomon when Adonijah was trying to cause a revolt and all of that. And he also slew Joab. He was the one that killed Joab. Joab had fled to the temple for sanctuary and grabbed a hold of the horns of the altar. And if you know anything about Joab, Joab was probably the greatest general that ever lived. A very, very powerful warrior. And it was Benaiah who went down there and pulled the sword and slew him right off the altar because Solomon told him to and was eventually made the general of the army in Joab's stead. So Benaiah is a very powerful man. Second Samuel 8.18, the Bible says this about Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, was over both the Cherethites and the Pelethites, and David's sons were chief rulers. And then again, I'm going to read our text to us. And Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, the son of a valiant man of Kabziel, who had done many acts, he slew two lion-like men of Moab, he went down also and slew a lion in the midst of a pit in time of snow. And he slew an Egyptian, a goodly man. And the Egyptian had a spear in his hand, but he went down to him with a staff, plucked the spear out of the Egyptian's hand, and slew him with his own spear. That's pretty bad, eh? That's pretty tough. These things did Benaiah the son of Jehoiada and had the name among uh, three mighty men. Uh, he was more honorable than the thirty, but he attained not to the first three, and David set him over his guard. Uh, I, I take this as if he was probably number four man. Uh, probably three other men above him that probably were a little tougher or more honorable. I'm not real exactly. Uh, that, that's more or less what he's trying to say here. But he attained not to the first three. And David set him over his guard. I was studying about this man here and just reading what different people had to say about him. Some thought he was actually a spy for Solomon. And uh, a very shrewd, uh, very cunning man. But uh, it's a lot of things that I did, but I want to capitalize on one particular incident found in 2 Samuel 23 and 20. The Bible said that he went down also and slew a lion in the midst of a pit in time of snow. And I want to preach tonight, if the Lord will help me, on three ways to die and one way to live. Now, I know that there are probably many spiritual ways, many, many ways to die spiritually. We could list a lot of things. But I think that they're going to fall into three categories. Uh, it's going to be by the hands of the lion, number one. It's going to be by being trapped in a pit, number two. And folks die spiritually by getting caught in the snow, number three. I think that I can put all of our spiritual trials in, into those three categories. The enemy, the pit, and the snow. I'm going to try to hurry. Uh, if, you, if you'll pay real good attention, I'll, I'll get over this, get through with this, and we'll have an altar call and let you talk to the Lord about things. The first thing that the Bible says Benaiah did was he went down also and slew a lion. And we, we understand you've been preached to enough, you've read the Word of God enough to understand that this lion represents the devil. The Bible said, Be sober. 
Be vigilant for your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. And so we, we see this uh, happen in the book of Job. Uh, the Bible says that the sons of, uh, of God had come to, to worship and gather around the throne. To, uh, there the, the, the angels of the Lord came around the throne of God and Satan came in the midst of them. And the Lord asked him, what are you doing? And whence comest thou? And Satan answered and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. We know the story well. He said, Have you considered my servant Job? And he said, You can take everything he's got, but you can't lay your hands on him. And so he took everything, and, and Job still wouldn't buckle. Job wouldn't turn away from God. And so he came a second time. And again, From which comest thou? And Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and up and down in it. Now, it's very important that we understand that the enemy is not omnipresent. Uh, we give him too much credit. He cannot be at your house and my house at the same time. He's either to or fro or up or down. But the thing about it is he's got an extensive uh, governing system with many millions of devils and demons, whatever you want to call them, powers, principalities. And I mean, it's a very vast, very extensive government very detailed right down to those little imps that, that mess with your mind throughout the day and torment you. And the enemy knows what he's doing. He's got specific, powerful prince spirits over, over cities and it just filters down. And I don't really have time to go through all of that, but I want you to know that we're not messing with just a, a weak adversary here. We're fighting against a lion. We're fighting against one that can easily destroy us, can easily t- t- destroy our minds and cause a man to go insane. Really could. He really could. You say, how could a person go insane? Well, you take away the blood and you take away the Word of God and you take away church and you take away everything else, to, uh, spiritually speaking, and there would be some people inside this church that would lose their minds. And we would come and visit you in the insane asylum because without the, the, the protecting hand and the shielding hand of God, the enemy could easily overcome and override any one of us. Amen. I mean, nervous wreck and, and falling apart and, and folk on nerve pills and, and they're visiting psychologists and, and they're over here at this one and they're over there at that one. It's nothing more than the enemy attacking men's minds. And it's in the church. The most nervous people I know, I've never really been able to relate. I've had a few instances where I felt, I think maybe just God let the heads down a little bit so I could understand what it meant to just really be nervous. But at the same time, I never lost uh, the focus that I knew what it was. The enemy was roaring against my mind. He was fighting against my mind. And I was walking around. I began to think, well, nobody cares. And, and nobody loves me. And nobody wants me as their pastor. Nobody wants to hear me preach. Nobody cares about me singing. Nobody wants to hear me play the guitar. And, and before you know it, you're shaking. Uh, and your family's going to be a mess. And I'm dying. And my heart's going to explode. And, and all these things and you become a nervous wreck and it's nothing but an attack of the enemy and if God were to walk away from us church you would find us in a straight jacket somewhere wondering what happened I'll tell you what happened the enemy came the enemy came like a roaring lion to devour you he's powerful tonight he's powerful tonight and he's walking about why? because he wants to catch you by surprise number one The lion is very cunning. And you know what I think amazes me the most about him? How fast he can move. How swiftly he can destroy. I mean, I've got... I'm not going to say this again. I'm not glorifying the enemy. I'm not not, going to say it because it's just... I'm not. But I find every day, I understand, I am not going to overcome him with a mediocre prayer life. I'm not going to overcome him by mediocre studying and mediocre fasting and and mediocre preaching and mediocre just being a mediocre Christian. I'm not going to overcome the enemy. 
And this church is not going to prosper. It's not going to sail to the stars as we preach uh, just going through the motions. I have come to understand that though my wife and I have a good marriage, I have seen the enemy slip in so quick and test my marriage and test our relationship. A relationship that I didn't think could be tested. No, we're not falling apart. But I'm talking about the rapidity in which the line can move in and you one day you're feeling good and the next you're wondering what happened. One day you think things are going great and the enemy comes in by surprise and he takes you so fast you shake your head and say, God, what happened? What happened? How could it come so quick? The Bible said in Luke 21, 34 through 36, And take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness and cares of this life, and so that they come upon you unawares. We're going to be overtaken unaware. Just minding our own business, as the old saying is. And, and we wake up one day, and, and before the day ends, before the sun sets, our life is destroyed, and everything that we thought was going to go right goes wrong. And we shake ourselves from the dust and wonder how come everything has been destroyed because we allowed the enemy to come in unaware. The enemy wants to catch you by surprise tonight. He doesn't always face you head up. That's one of the reasons we're having such a struggle in Iraq. Iraq, I said Iraq. Everybody else says Iraq. I say Iraq. Amen. However you want to say it tonight, I don't hardly say anything right, so don't copy me. That's one of the reasons we're struggling with the terrorists. That's why we're still in war in Afghanistan. That's why we're still fighting over in the Middle East. That's why we've got homeland security. Because we're trying to figure out how do you fight an enemy that you can't see? How do you fight an enemy that you can't pinpoint? How do you fight an enemy? We're used to fighting wars where they stand on the other side of the line and they wear their hats and beat their drums and they wave their banners. But now we're fighting an enemy that dresses up like the population and puts their bombs right inside the cities and they're hiding amongst the people and they pull the machine guns out of the roads and you can't shoot at them because they've got 50 kids around them. We're fighting an enemy that we can't see, that we can't tell who they are and the enemy is the same exact way. You see, that Vietnam War was the first time uh, that we really had faced guerrilla warfare like that. Uh, They was used to just dropping bombs on a city, dropping bombs on a place, uh, lining up and shooting back and forth. Uh, But when they went down there uh, to to Vietnam, uh, they found some people that knew how to hide. Uh, They had had, had tunnels dug underneath mountains, uh, and they had booby traps all over the place. uh, And it shocked them uh, because the enemy wasn't facing them head up. They were coming around them strategically, or catching them by surprise. Have you not found out yet? The enemy's not always going to line himself up and come to you head on. He's going to trap you. He's going to catch you by surprise. And you're going to wake up in hell one morning and say, how did this happen? I was in church. I was a preacher. I was a Sunday school teacher. How did I end up in hell? Help us, Holy Ghost. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 5 and 6, Therefore let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. Let us not sleep as others, but let the sentry be awake. I saw a picture one time, I wish. If you, if you find it, buy it for me, I'll pay you back. The sleeping sentry. He was in his watchtower asleep. And you saw out the other side of the wall a whole army had aligned itself against the city. And he slept. No trumpets. No warnings to the people. And they were going to batter that gate down. And they're going to kill everything in the city. Hopefully they'll kill the sentry first. Uh, Some of us are asleep. 
That's how he catches a lot of people unawares because we sleep. We're like zombies. We're in a sleepwalking. We, we go through the motions. And for some reason we have this mindset that the enemy's not, he's not got us on his mind. Now this is exactly what he's waiting for. This is the precise moment he's waiting for. He, he's concerned about you when you're praying and he's calculating and he's, and he's strategizing because he wants to destroy you. But he, he doesn't make a habit of fighting you when you're the strongest because Job whips him all over the place. But he likes to catch men asleep. He likes to catch men when they're off guard. You know, uh, uh, I, 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 I didn't, I didn't really lose that fight. But really the only fight that I ever came close to losing was uh, I redeemed myself. I'm not trying to boast a brag. I'm just telling you what happened. I was just walking down the hallway and I felt two big old strong hands, big six foot, one guy, monster. 250, of course, that there myself. He is huge. And he came me by the back with a lot and just started spinning me around. Now if he had come to me face up, that would never happened. No. And he finally messed up and slammed me against a locker. And I was able to turn. And then the battle switched momentum. It went my way. But it caught me by surprise. You, you can hurt people if you catch them by surprise. And not really. You can knock somebody out so fast. Well, when we sleep, we're in trouble. We're in trouble. And uh, I was talking to Brother Jason about sleep apnea. I got an uncle, my uncle Jim. I wish I could get him down here. He's such an awesome man. He's not a very healthy man. He's got sleep apnea. And when he goes to sleep, he forgets to breathe. And so they have to keep oxygen on him all the time. Or he'll die. And I think that some of us have grown so poor in health and the spirit that we've gotten spiritual sleep apnea. And we're forgetting to breathe. You know what breathing is in the Spirit? It's praying. You inhale the Spirit of God. You exhale worship. And so the enemy catches men while they sleep. The third thing that I've got here is Luke twenty two thirty one, And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you enemy sift you as we. And so the enemy wants to sift God's miracle mission. And I've taught on this. I even thought about this, this not even talking about it tonight. Because I have talked about this so much, but the Lord impressed it up on my heart. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as we. What does that mean? The sifting process is a slow process. It's, uh, it doesn't happen overnight. It takes weeks and months to sift all the wheat. Uh, they had a few different ways of doing it. They would take the wheat to a hillside when the wind was blowing. They would thresh it, of course, thresh it. And throw it into the air. The wind would carry off the lighter weighted chaff. The wheat would fall to the ground. And they did this over and over and over until most of the chaff was gone and the wheat was all that was left. They had, uh, uh, the best that I can describe would be a colander of some sort. They could even more finely uh, sift. But if you know anything about sifting, it's kind of like the hourglass. You flip it and and it drains. And it's subtle. It's subtle. Nobody backslides overnight. Nobody turns and goes away from God overnight. It may look like they backslid overnight. They may get caught with another man's wife. And it may look like they fell. But the process started a long time ago. The process started a long time ago. Many weeks ago. Many months ago. I'm not boasting, but the enemy would never destroy me in one night. If he took everything I had, if he killed my family, if God, if God allowed that, I wouldn't backslide. Eventually I might, if I didn't pray and I didn't seek the face of God. But he's not going to overtake me in one night. He's not going to destroy my wife in one night. It's going to take him weeks and months and years if he ever can. He's not going to destroy us in one night. And so there's a process. A sifting process. Now there are some new converts, they come in, the enemy hits him or her full force, and they buckle and they fall underneath the pressure. 
But even at that, I feel like if a person really genuinely gets locked down in God, the enemy has such a struggle. Uh, even defeating the weakest Christian because God always steps up on their behalf. But the enemy has found out that if I can uh, cause her to not pray today, she may pray on Tuesday. But if I can get her to stop praying on Mondays and, and maybe Wednesday again, uh, hamper her prayer life where she's only praying maybe two days a week, uh, eventually you're going to find yourself going an entire week and weeks and months and you think about God and you drive down the, in the road in your car and you think about God and every now and then you knock the dust off your Bible and read a verse of Scripture and you come to church and you still pay your tithes but the enemy is sifting you like weed. You don't pray like you're supposed to. You don't fast like you never fast. You don't read the Word of God like you're supposed to. It's not an overnight deal. The enemy is sifting you like wheat. That's why men wake up one morning and they look over and it's not their wife on the same pillow and they shake their head and say, how did that happen? Because when you get sifted like wheat, it's not one thing. It's not two things that happen. It wasn't just one occurrence, but it was a process of time, a process of allowing the enemy to shift you. And when you notice it, there's only a few grains of sand left. But I would beseech someone tonight, flip the hourglass back on before the enemy destroys you and there's nothing left. He sifts us like wheat. If he can get you weak enough, he'll throw everything at you. He'll throw everything he's got. In, in the martial arts realm, you hurt somebody, you pounce them like a tiger. You don't walk into a ring, Brother Jason, and throw everything. You size your opponent up. You, 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 you try to think your way through things. But Brother Razor, if you throw a punch and you hit him and he staggers, you don't wait for him to recuperate. You hit him again immediately with everything you have. This is what happens. Many fights have lost, have been lost by a stronger opponent because they threw everything they had. And the enemy kept getting hit and hit and hit. And they were still standing. They exerted all their energy. But I want to tell you this. Some of you are at a place right now that if you don't do something pretty quick, you're not going to be standing much longer. Because the enemy has caught you wounded. And you're only going to take so many punches. I don't care how tough you are. You hit somebody enough. They're going to fall. But you know, I think, I, think we, I think we do like Samson. Oh, I've done it so many times. Still shook myself. And still had the power. But see, there came a point in Samson's life. He woke and shook himself. And he wished not that the Lord had departed from him. And then he found himself blinded. He's sifting some of us like we. And it's going to happen over a process of time. And we need to recognize. Uh, we're told in 1 Peter 4 and 7 that uh, but the end of all things is at hand. Uh, be sober and watch under prayer. Now we've, we've heard this several times. Uh, uh, concerning your adversary the devil as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. He starts the whole verse off saying, be sober. Be vigilant. Uh, I read to you in First Thessalonians 5 and 6, Therefore let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. The same words, vigilant, sober, watching, sober. And then we find here in First Peter 4 and 7, But the end of all things is at hand. 
Be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer. The enemy will destroy you. Satan will destroy you. He will destroy you so thoroughly. There's nothing left when he's done. Not even a resemblance of what was a woman of God or man of God. Brother Dustin, we can't, we can't understand the enemy. Because we're used to people with compassion. Even the most hardened, hardened people that I know, there's a spark of compassion sometimes. Satan has no compassion. Not one grain, Sister Joni. And he doesn't want to destroy you. He wants to destroy your children. And he doesn't just want to destroy my children. He wants to burn them to ashes and spread their ashes over the pits of hell. He doesn't just want to wound my babies. God, would you help us too? The Bible says that that lion was in the pit. I guess I got more preaching here than I thought I did. It says the lion was in the pit. He went down also and slew a lion in the midst of the pit. The pit, the pit. And I, I was thinking, what, what, what exactly does this pit stand for? And it speaks to us of dark places in life. But the thing that I, I think that's been up on my mind the most is this pit is a place of depression. And that's probably the most horrible pit. It's that place of depression. Now, you understand what depression is? It's exactly what it says. It depresses you. It pushes you. It, you, you, you. You're smothered. And you can't function. But you can't hardly breathe. You ever been so depressed you couldn't breathe? You ever been so oppressed by the enemy you could barely breathe? I mean, if you've not been there, I've been there many times. I just panted, physically panting for breath because my heart was so heavy laden, so burdened. And the enemy has a way of depressing us. Now, even David said it in Psalms 28 and 1. Unto thee will I cry, O Lord, my rock, be not silent to me, lest if thou be silent to me, I become like them that go down into the pit. Now, he's probably talking about uh, Hades there or Shoal or, or whatever the Hebrew word is there. But he says a pit. I'm going to go down into a pit like others. If you don't speak and say something to me, God, if you stay silent, I'm going to go down into a pit. And that's what happens to us. We go weeks and we don't hear His voice. And we go months and we haven't really saw His face. And we don't really hear Him talking to us like He desires to talk to us. And before we know it, we have found ourselves in a deep, dark depression. We're in a place of darkness. A place that we don't understand why we're feeling this way. Why can't I get up? Why can't I get victory? Because the darkness has engulfed us. I'm telling you, the pit is a terrible place to be. The Bible said that they threw Jeremiah into a pit twice. One time more severely. I think Jeremiah 38 was more severe. Then they took Jeremiah and cast him into the dungeon of Malachi, the son of Hamalek. Uh, that was in the court of the prison, and they let down Jeremiah with cords. And in the dungeon there was no water but mire. So Jeremiah sunk in the mire. What a, a graphic picture of the spiritual condition of many people. How they sink into a dungeon uh, and they can't move their feet because they are sunken in mire and they're sunken in muck and the beat it all is dark and the Word of God said there's no water down there. You cannot stay in a pit, saints of God, and expect to be a fruitful Christian. You cannot stay in a pit of prayerlessness. It's a dark place where a man doesn't pray. It's a dark place where a woman is a seek the face of God. And the longer you stay in a pit, the thirstier you get and the weaker you become and the less chances of you ever surviving. As long as you're in the pit, you're in grave, grave danger tonight. I mean the enemy, the lion was in a pit. It's one thing to be in a pit. It's another thing to be in a pit with a lion. The enemy, you've heard of, I'm in the pits. You've heard that I it's pretty much what he's talking about. A lot of times we don't understand the severity of being in the pit. We think that we're just going to get out. We're going to shake ourselves and things are going to go back to normal. But it doesn't always happen that way. It doesn't always happen that way. People die in depression. They die 
in a, a, a state of mind that says, I'm never going to get out. This is the way it's always going to be. With that mentality, that's true. With that mentality, it'll never change. I've said it many times. If you don't like the way your life is, change it. Don't tell me you can't change. Don't tell me you can't change the circumstances. Don't tell me that you can't wake up in the morning and say, Today I choose to be something else. I know you can if you really want to. I said if you really want to. But folks really don't want to. They're too selfish. And they want to be like they are. But as long as you stay like you are, it's going to be the same old, same old for the rest of your life. A pit is another place to die. You get in a pit long enough, you'll die first. You'll die. You'll lose your vision. The darkness will zap you. When you can't see anymore, the darkness will kill you. And you become bitter in the pit. I said you become bitter in the pit. And a pit is a place of isolation. One of the most dangerous things that you can do is isolate yourself. The first thing men do when I see men begin to isolate themselves or women pulling themselves away, I realize immediately that they're not praying and they're getting ready to fall because they're going to find themselves in a dark pit, groping in the night, looking for some help, not understanding that all around them is an enemy trying to kill them. He's waiting. He's biding his time. And when you throw in the white towel of surrender, he will. Kill you. The pit will make you bitter. Amen. You know, and I, I hadn't even really thought about it until I got into the midst of this, and I was thinking about Sunday night as I began to talk along these lines. How the line he waits. I was warning God's miracle mission. What the Holy Ghost showed me. He's not going to jump out in the front of the pack. He's not going to try to cause the lamb to backslide tonight. He knows it's not going to work. But what he's going to do is he's going to eye that herd of wildebeest running and those that are lagging behind, those that are struggling, those that are not praying, those that are just barely making it. He's going to reach his bloody paw out. He's going to snatch you from the flock. He's going to snatch you from the herd. Hey! I said he's going to kill you. And so you better start praying. You're going to start fasting and get the Spirit of God in your life. Or you're going to find yourself being consumed by a den of lions. It's a dangerous place. Isolated. Isolated. And this is what happens. Brother Razor starts isolating himself. And... The enemy tells him that Brother Johnson doesn't like him. And at the same time, he tells Brother Johnson that Brother Razor don't like him. And you take a few steps back. This is how church gets split. This is how people leave churches. This is going to do a little pastoring tonight, okay? I want to share a little wisdom with you tonight. Uh, my child hits your child. Well, I'm going to whip my child when I get home. Don't get mad at me. I do my very best to correct my child. If your child hits my child, I'm not going to get mad at you. But this is what happens. Brother Dustin has a, a five-year-old, and I've got a seven-year-old, and my seven-year-old hits his five-year-old, and Five-year-old runs to daddy and says, she did this. and Nothing happens. And next thing you know, two mamas are mad at each other. Two daddies are. And they step back. You know I'm telling the truth. Here's it. Call a women's meeting. One woman's not there. They can't withhold the plans because of you. They push forward and they make plans. But Sister Scott wasn't there, that meeting. And then she hears about all these plans and she says, well, they didn't tell me about it. And she steps back. And she steps back. And then Sister Lamb says, what's wrong with Sister Scott? She must be mad at me. And Sister Lamb steps back. 
And now a family that's supposed to be strong and united and help each other is now so far apart. And everybody's mad at everybody. And the truth is nobody's done anything wrong. And nobody said anything. But it's in your mind. And you found yourself in a pit. Amen. Amen. And so Brother Dustin ends up over at another church because Brother Lamb don't love him. And Brother Lamb would die for that boy. The enemy doesn't care. All he cares about is whether you believe him or not. If he can cause you to believe a lie and be damned, a soul being, it'll make him all that much more happy. Amen. Amen. God help us. You know, pit hemmed up with the enemy. You can't win like that. You can't win like that. Do you remember when Saul laid down in that cave? Do, do, do you remember? Was it a cave of Adullam? Was it a Adullam? Do you remember what atmosphere Saul laid down in? He had hundreds of soldiers. David's soldiers. David's wild men. David's men were thirsty to kill Saul. David had to hold him back, but he was in a dungeon at night at dark, and all around that cave there was men wanting to slay Saul. But David said, no, and I'm going to tell you tonight that in the place that you're in, you're surrounded, and the only reason you're not in hell right now is because King Jesus has said, no, not yet. That's the only reason some of you are alive tonight. Amen. It's a lonely place. And the pit can be the most trying of all our encounters as Christians because once you get in the pit, nobody cares about you. Nobody loves you. And nobody thinks about you. And when you get in the pit, you're upset because the Lamb didn't call you. And Brother Jason said, because I didn't come out and visit him. And you know what he does? He steps back. And he steps back. And then Brother Lamb sees Brother Corey, who has stepped back ten feet. And I don't know how to approach you, brother. I don't know how to approach you, sister. Amen. I don't know what to do. Amen. 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 Holy Ghost is a gentleman. I believe pastors should be gentlemen. I don't like to intrude on your lives all the time. I get tired of pastors trying to control everybody. Tell them who you can be friends with and who you can't be friends with. That ain't none of my business. As long as you stay holy and your company is holy, you're all right. But when it comes to situations like this and you're a million miles from me, I don't know what to say to you. Amen. The pit that'll kill you. And it ain't so much the pit that kills you. It's what's in that pit that you can't see. It's the effects that the pit has upon your mind. It'll drive you crazy. I never could understand. I see people in a church with all kinds of people that love them. And they're talking about nobody cares. And I said, everybody cares. Nobody cares. Everybody cares. Everybody loves you. If you was out there in the sunlight, you wouldn't be saying that sort of stuff. If you was in the sunlight, you wouldn't be thinking that sort of stuff because you can see. Man, the pit will kill you. The pit will stop you from preaching. Do you know that? I about quit preaching a few times, Brother Johnson. I mean it. I love to preach. You know, and I'd rather do it. Maybe I'd put a sermon together. I might enjoy putting sermons together more than I love preaching. I about gave it all a few times. Because I got in pits for the Lord. Or nobody wanted me to preach. And you know what happened in the end? Nobody did want me to preach. Because I withdrew myself. And they saw me. And they said, what's wrong with that guy? 
He don't talk to nobody. He's not friendly. He's got an attitude on him all the time. And I'm over here saying, man, these folks are stuck up and they don't care. They're highfalutin big camp meetings. They don't want me to preach. And then the Lord showed me that if I would show myself friendly to people, that doors would open. And so I started shaking hands and sitting down with people I didn't know. And say, hey, you mind if I sit here? And the next thing you know, I'm a full-time evangelist. And I'm begging God to give me a week off. Preach 12, 13 weeks straight. About to die. I have physical breakdowns. I didn't have no rest. It's all a matter of the mind. Oh, yeah. In every area. When you get in the pit and he messes with your mind. He messes with your mind. Before you know it, as a man thinketh, so was he. It's a man thinking. And you know, one thing, I've been accused of being cocky, arrogant. I don't think time. Folks that don't know me. And one reason is, is because I've understood, I've understood, and I do it sometimes, and it's, it's, it's terrible preaching ethics. You don't go to the pulpit and talk about how bad you are. I know I can't preach. I know, because... Before it's over, the people begin to think that. So God bless this poor little heart. I said, just going to the pulpit and preaching. What, what do you think? It, it matters a lot. I need to move on. I could have preached three sermons, but I didn't really feel like it. And so he went down also and slew a lion in the midst of a pit. In time of snow. So, there's three ways to die. You die at the hands of the lion. Or you can die inside a dark pit. There's another way to die. And that's by the coldness. The lack of warmth. Because he, he, he slew a lion in the midst of a pit in time of snow. You understand what Benaiah tackled? He tackled three things that could have killed him. Some of you Floridians can't relate. It's hard to preach about snow in Florida. But I know a lot about snow and I love it. But I also respect it. A lot of lives lost. Many, many millions of dollars in damage. Billions and billions of dollars. There's nothing any more prettier, probably not proper English, nothing prettier, to my opinion, is when it sleets real heavy in Kentucky. And it hits about 28 degrees. And you walk outside and there's all these trees. And it looks like a crystal palace. Everything you see has got these beautiful icicles hanging off of. And you just marvel. And then you see caved in porches. And you can't drive down the road, Brother Johnson, because power lines snapped. And you got no phone and you got no electric before it's over because it's very damaging. But here's really, I guess, two points that I, I, I got. There's a lot that I could preach about. It destroys your members. Let me explain to you. Uh, in a time of severe coldness, being exposed to the cold too long can kill you. Hyperthermia sets in. You understand that? Frostbite. It destroys your fingers. It destroys your toes. It destroys your ears and your nose. Your eyebrows. Any, any, anything that it can... Destroy. It destroys. And it destroys the outer extremities first. And then works its way in. Again, it attacks the weaker vessels. It can't destroy your heart immediately. It can't destroy your kidneys immediately. It works from the extremities. And works its way in. You see, you get to a place in God... <clears throat> 
a cold place, a place of snow. And when you don't feel the warmth of God, you will do like Simon Peter. You will warm yourself by the enemy's fireplace. It's inevitable. It's inevitable. Man's got to have fire. I, you know, people say, who invented fire? I'm going to tell you who invented fire. God invented fire. He shot a lightning bolt out of the sky, hit a tree, and it caught on fire. And caveman said, fire. That's who invented fire. Because God knew man needed fire. We have to have fire to exist. You cannot lay in freezing cold weather and expect to wake up in the morning the same way you laid down. I mean, I've seen those Buddhist monks go up in them mountains and it freezes. They can only do that for so long, so many days with a Johnson. There comes a day them Buddhist monks have got to come out of that mountain and get inside a house with some fire so they can warm themselves. You think you're going to stay out in the winter of snow all the time for days and weeks and years and live? You're crazy. You're going to wake up and you're going to be missing you're not going to be here one Sunday morning because frostbite has caused you to decay. Second thing, it caused you to lose feeling. I mean, that's a very obvious thing. I had a baptizer one time. I was a razor baptized about 70. It was February, January, February, somewhere there. In the, I mean, a dead of the winter. And I went down in that water. I was in there about two hours. About 30 degrees, 32 degrees. I was in the water about two hours. When I came out of the water, I couldn't feel. I had to make sure I was walking because it took me hours to get the feeling back in my legs. And I'm not even talking about up in Antarctica somewhere. Just in a little cool water for a couple hours. I had to make sure my foot was on the gas pedal. I had to watch my foot touch the brakes. I'd never experienced that before. But if you stay out in the cold long enough, you'll get to where you lose feeling and you'll do things that you never dreamed that you do. And you'll say things that you said you never say when you get out in the cold long enough. Amen. I think I'm going to close this thing up with one more, one more point. I'm preaching on three ways to die and one way to live. I, I want to leave you with this thought. The Bible said that Benaiah went down. I like this. I like this. The Bible said that Benaiah went down. What are you saying, Brother Lamb? Uh, he saw the lion. Perhaps he was even chasing the lion. And he saw the lion go into a pit in time of snow. And the Bible said that Benaiah went down. I love it. I love it. He didn't run from the line. He pursued the line. He pursued him into a pit in the time of snow. And I'd like to tell somebody now there comes a time in our lives that we've got to quit being chased by the enemy. We've got to quit being whipped by the enemy. I mean, but Naya, he faced three ways to die and he lived. Can somebody tell me how he lived? He went into that pit in time of snow with a line and he fought and he fought and he fought and he fought. He came out victorious. I didn't say he staggered into the pit, saw a lion and fought. He went down intentionally into a pit and he began to fight. He was a man on a mission. He said, I'm going to kill you before you kill me. And now we're reading about him several thousand years later because a man said, I believe I'll fight and I believe I'll live. Are you there tonight? Isn't it time that you become a fighter instead of a quitter and you come out the victory? Stand across the house. Three ways to die. Let us face whatever it is that's trying to destroy us. Let's face it. Leviticus 26 and 8. And five of you shall chase a hundred. And a hundred of you shall put ten thousand in a flight. And your enemies shall fall before you by the sword. Hebrews 11:34. Faith Hall of Fame. Talking about all those precious saints of God. 1134 said, Quench the violence of fire. Escape the edge of the sword. Out of weakness were made strong. Waxed valiant in flight. And I like this. They turned to flight 
the armies of the aliens. I mean, they turned to flight the enemies that came against them. Instead of running into a pit and freezing to death, they pushed their way until the enemy turned and retreated. And they didn't stop. They chased them in the mountains. They chased them in the dungeons. They chased them in the caves. And they said, we will win. And Gideon said, we will win. We've only got 300. We're going to chase these Midianites to the extremities of the earth. We're going to win. And we've got to fight. If you don't fight, you're going to die. Amen. Amen. Father, we come to you tonight in the name of Jesus. I'm asking and praying, Lord, that you look down upon us. I've preached my heart tonight. I'm asking you, Lord, to strengthen me. I've felt a sweet anointing tonight. I've felt you deal with hearts. Oh, God. Some are in one of those places I talked about, perhaps all three. Unless they fight now, they're going to lay there in that pit, a bloody, mangled carcass with no life. And somebody's going to stagger upon the remains and say, who is that? And they're going to be un- un- unidentifiable. Maybe that was so-and-so. I'm begging you, Jesus. I'm begging you, Jesus. Brother Corey, can you get on the piano, please? And you know the beautiful thing about it all? We have a choice. Every per- I didn't come with a sermon tonight. You see my notes. Brother Lamb preaches out of ten pages. I got... I got a little skeleton thoughts. I didn't even have time to finish them. Sister Janita, I was on like point two when you came in there to talk to me. I had to finish it up in 13 minutes. That's been on my heart. It's time for us to turn this thing around. Well, it's going to be cold. Yes, it is. It's going to be tough. But you've got to be willing to do whatever it takes. Why sit we here? God's beckoning. He's calling. The pastor's trying to save. I'm trying to throw a lifeline out. 